Welcome to Our Heroes, a program which focuses on leaders of the great country Nigeria, a profile on those that run the affairs of the country, most of whom have since passed on, and we remember them with blessed memory. Some, we are privileged to still have them with us, so we cherish to focus on their life, in their time, in appreciation of their stewardship to their fatherland. You welcome once again. <laughs> Our heroes last week was a focus on the evolution of modern Nigeria from October 1st, 1960 and the emergence of leaders of the First Republic and their preceding activities as the founding fathers of the great country Nigeria. Many Nigerians described the First Republic and the political actors of the time as the veritable platform on which the Nigerian sovereign state of today derived its strength, prosperity, socio-political dynamism and resilience. Not only because of the sense of foresight of the leaders of that time, but also due to their resoluteness in facing the challenges of self-government with the exit of the imperial powers and their unflinching desire to ensure the continued existence of the dare coveted corporate entity Nigeria, which the world at that time looked up as the hope and dream for Africa as a whole. It was indeed in that spirit that the First Republic took off with the zeal and commitment to take Nigeria to greater height and the African continent in general. For six years, the First Republic survived all the hiccups and vagaries of statehood in its pioneering experience before it had to give way to another form of government altogether, the emergence of military rule, the first military interregnum in the political history of Nigeria. The first generation of leaders, i.e. those who led us in the First Republic, were the leaders created for us by the British colonial state in Nigeria. And uh, we can't judge them fairly unless you understand what colonial state implies and what they stand to pursue and uh, their objectives and goals. Unless we understand this, we will be misplacing our judgment. The colonial state in Nigeria came purposely for the interests of the colonizing power. And in this case, it is the British, it is Britain. And um, 
all their policies, decisions, and actions were geared towards realizing this objective. It is within these circumstances the first crop of leaders we had in Nigeria, whether regional, local, or even federal, were produced. And then um, the colonial states started producing them, uh, preparing them for takeover as from 1952, after the Mafeson Constitution. And uh, these were the ones, that is how they are, the directions were set for them by the time we had our independence. And it was within this social milieu the leaders performed. And then um, within this social milieu, I think that we wouldn't blame them much. They performed within their capacity and ability to satisfy the Nigerian populace. But again, having taken a hindsight into their problems, achievements, and so on and so forth, one is tempted to say, look, you, the, 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 the leaders did not appreciate the fact of the body that was handed over to, to them. And they did not do anything to restructure the power relationship that was inherited. And that was where the problem started. They should have understood that what was handed over to, by the colonial state was intended to continue to serve the colonial interest even after our independence. They did not appreciate this. And they did not appreciate this in terms of economic arrangement handed over to us. They did not appreciate it in terms of political arrangement handed over to us. And hence, they became the victim of the system that produced them. And this is what led to the first coup. First of all, the crisis, you call it uh, the Western crisis, uh, the operation wet here, uh, the chief crisis, call it what? You can build them up within the problems created by colonial state. Independence came to many African states, and in the West particularly, there was hope that Nigeria, as well as other African countries, would become, quote unquote, the bastion of Western democracy, as it related to the spread of communism in the West. It didn't take quite long before Western analysts were disappointed with our own democracy in Africa, and they opted for the military in late 60s. And their argument then was that the military was more organized, more self-abnegating, uh, more puritanic, more nationalistic, more cohesive. And that continued till through the 70s. And so by the coup of January 15, 1966, the Nigerian armed forces took over the government of the Federation. A new leader of the nation emerged, a military man, General Agu Ronsi. His coming was preceded by a socio-political crisis and the subsequent coup, which consumed the Prime Minister, Alaji Abubakar Tafa Balewa. The premiers of northern and western regions, uh, Amadou Bella Saddam and Sakwatu, and Chief Samuel Ladu Kintola, and some other top government functionaries of the First Republic. It was in such terrain that General Louis Renzi thrived with the task of reunification of the country. Renzi, of course, came, you know, uh, in the circumstances that is very difficult. Uh, a coup was executed, and it plopped, so to speak, and he took over. He was uh, divided between trying to keep the nation and also trying to see if the mutineers, if they are so-called, you know, can be disciplined. And against the objective of, the, of, of their coup, they said they came, you know, to stamp out corruption, to unite the country. And at that time, it, it was an excuse that was readily accepted. So it was very difficult for Iranci now to abandon them 
and simply clamp them into jail or punish them. At the same time, there are people who have been seriously offended and who feel that these people must be disciplined because they have uh, done something wrong. They have terminated democracy, they have conducted a sectional killing, and so on and so forth. So this is the man. Now, he came and decided to take a decision which he thought will bring the country together and reduce you know, the problems that the coup makers, uh, that prompted uh, you know, the coup as defined then. Then he now uh, brought his decree, the unity decree, to make Nigeria a unitary state, to abolish the regions and regroup them and that was fundamental in the Nigerian political process at that time. It was rejected, and he paid with his life. Uh, if people regard that as failure, they must assess that in relation to what I've earlier said, in relation to his time and the circumstances that, that brought him. You will recall that what the steps Iran took in his unification decree were far less strenuous or uh, yeah, far less unifying and centralizing if you compare to even the nature and the shape and the content of the Federation today. But he has to pay, you know, with his life uh, at 35 or, or four years ago. So, uh, I mean, when we want to assist him, we must assist him in those circumstances. I would say that the beauty about Iran's regime is the fact that his unification decree now stimulated, you know, thoughts in Nigeria in terms of trying to balance between the forces of center, between centripetal forces and centrifugal forces, between the forces that are pulling the nation and the forces that should bring the nations together. By the time of event, another leader emerged after another military coup that toppled the government of General Ironsi. In July 1966, he was General Yakub Gawon. The government of General Yakub Gawon had the task of unifying the country and fundamentally too, subsequently managing and seeing to the end of the Nigeria's three-year civil war. Given the setting in which we found ourselves when the military came in 66, their inability to manage conflicts, their inability to strike compromises like politicians did, led to the civil war. But I think after some time, they learned that you cannot run the society as a barracks. And after the civil war, it can be argued that the military was part of a solution to the problem of the challenge to nationhood, challenge to statehood, Nigerian statehood. I haven't said that, the mil that the military was part of a solution to the problem of the challenge to statehood. Over time, the military found that as they got into the quag political quagmire, they neglected their military sense of professionalism. So the military institution became endangered. Eronsi uh, did not leave Nigeria in a civil war. He tried to unite uh, problems, and then he was uh, 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 assassinated in a counter coup, and then another process, another process of fundamental significance to the political history of Nigeria now uh, started you know, with General Gawan. General Gawan, too, now assumed, like Ironsi, assumed the leadership of this country in difficult circumstances. Immediately, uh, uh, Ironsi was assassinated. The leadership fell on him. A young man would saddle with the task of keeping the nation together, the nation at the brink of collapse, the nation that has been has passed through very traumatic uh, ethnic and, and, and regional and geopolitical complex, 
that was the task before uh, General Gowan. Gowan for the Civil War, and he made sure that Nigeria remained united. And he had some of our leaders there with him, some of our past leaders. He had them in his government to ensure that what they, the past ones, fought for at the time of our independence we were not lost because of the military interven inter intervention. And uh, we also know very well that Gowan also improved the lives of Nigerian people by building more hospitals, improving the, uni the universities, improving commerce, the economy. The economy boomed under Gowan. We had foreign reserves. In fact, the problem of Nigeria in his time was where do we keep our money, not how to spend it. You see, then the subsequent regimes, military regimes, all in their own time and circumstances made their own contribution. I think next after the one was um, Murutala, mm -hmm. was Murutala. He too made his own contributions. He struggled against corruption, particularly in public service. He made tremendous impact. And his name has remained uh, uh, as a result of that uh, uh, in the minds of Nigerians. To Murutala Muhammad, the first issue was to restore discipline in all fabrics of the economy, especially the civil service. Any attempt to correct the mistakes of the past must start with the leadership of the institutions that were responsible. There was therefore no alternative but to apply firm and in some cases drastic measures in order to set the stage for healthier and more efficient services. The greatest thing about Nurtala is that when he said to cleansing the society, he had to start with himself. He wanted to approach equity with clean hands. And I think that is very, very significant and solitary to any success of any attempt you know, to change the attitude of people uh, and so on and so forth. So he came and uh, overthrew uh, General Gunn in a bloodless coup. And uh, with very, very uh, uh, unprecedented seriousness set up a political program. Unfortunately, there are forces that were also uh, against him. Uh, we remember his famous speech you know, in, in, at the OAU when he, uh, Nigeria recognized the MPL that Nigeria had come of age. He didn't need anybody to tell her what to do and what not to do. Did did not please the West very well. And uh, so many stories uh, uh, you know, surround you know, his assassination and so on. He sends discipline into society. He tries to cleanse in the society. But because also, if you look at the level of damage, this is the, the, the early part of Nigerian history, the drastic measures he took also had their consequences, negative consequences uh, on institutions, on individuals, and so on. But that has to be so. When you're going to clean a society that is rotting, or, or when you have to clean the organs table, when you are left with that, you, you, you have no option but to trample you know, uh, uh, on certain uh, uh, areas. Uh, maybe not, not, not because you, need, you wanted to, to punish anybody, but it has to be so. After the February 13, 1976 coup, which resulted in the assassination of General Murtala Ahmad Muhammad, the then Chief of Staff Supreme Headquarters, General Olusegun Obasanjo, assumed the mantle of leadership. I would like to appeal to all of you for calm and to avoid any action that might cause a breach of the peace. This is a period that calls for continuous vigilance, and it is the duty of one and all to maintain this vigilance in order to preserve the stability of the nation. He too made his own contribution. He was the first person, the first Nigerian leader, military leader, to embrace democracy and hand over voluntarily to a democratically elected government.
Year after it was shagari, he made tremendous impact. He demonstrated that democracy can work in this country. He demonstrated that people of this country can be united and stand on one platform and struggle for the benefit of all of us. He demonstrated that it is possible for Nigeria to speak with one voice. And Shagari did quite a lot. The Second Republic was important because that was the first time you had the civilians back on seat again after many years of military rule. The politicians, I must say, and this I say with a sense of responsibility, in spite of all the shouts and blames people heap on Shagari as a weak leader, you remember under the military, the same thing was said of uh, Gawam. I disagree. This is a very complex country, and you need a reconciliation leader. You cannot be dictatorial in this kind of context we find ourselves. You cannot be a mobilizational leader. You, you have to be a reconciliation leader. And I think Shagari tried to be a reconciliation leader. That meant that you have to reconcile contending interests in this in the polity the military had become a political power contestant it meant that you had to reconcile civilian sectors with the military sector you had to reconcile the various groups within the civilian sector it wasn't easy then you had to reconcile the primacy of economics with the primacy of politics and that's where chadari had a problem could he have done better with the economy did he strike enough balance between the economy the primacy of economics and the primacy of politics. My assessment is that the primacy of politics took a higher toll on his regime than the primacy of economics. And the result of that was that much of some of the laudable programs he had, he could not support because they were in funds to support them. And I think there were some forms of recklessness among politicians too. Uh, I don't think to the extent that people said they were talking about, but there were forms of recklessness. One thing about that regime, it exalted the freedom of the press, the freedom to speak. In fact, like Nigerians are doing now, they transfer, transformed democratic freedom into democratic license. And I think that's one gain of that regime. And you remember that many of the newspapers that proliferated within that period are still around, some of them. Some magazines died, others resurfaced, and all that. But it, I think to some extent, in terms of human liberty, it was a plus. In terms of trying to see if you could learn the nuances, the processes, the procedures of the presidential democratic system within a federal grid, it was a plus. People started. The second military interregnum in the political history of the country brought in General Muhammad Bukhari as the head of state. Societal discipline and prudence economic management became the priority areas of Bukhari's government. The Nigerian armed forces could not stand idly by where this country was drifting to a dangerous state of political and economic collapse. His major task was to reorder the, the thinking and the attitudes of Nigerians uh, so that they can be disciplined. And because you cannot achieve anything without discipline. And I think there's anything that Bari did that uh, will continue to touch the life of this nation is the discipline he also, in, in the fashion of Murtala, the discipline he also uh, uh, instilled in Nigeria in the 20 months, you know, he, he ruled this country. Uh, unfortunately, because of the desire, you know, to push this issue of discipline, uh, and because it's a military regime, and military, military, man, true, true, uh, not military politician, uh, therefore, he became very tough, uh, especially uh, he didn't enjoy the press. Uh, they were really at the throat of each other, the press and the government. Overall, 
he contributed substantially to making Nigerians realize that without discipline and self-reliance, they cannot develop. But he fell foul of the press, the human rights, they said uh, the, the, the so much abuse of human rights because of the decrease you know that protected the public servants and changed the you know the press and so on and so forth. In such terms that must be asked, subsequently the Babangida administration came into being with General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida at the helm of affairs. I wish to use this opportunity to say that the problem that this administration is facing are as enormous as when the last administration came into power. We shall pursue them with the greatest vigor and dynamism. Gentlemen, I wish to end this short address by reminding you of the hard times ahead of us. We must not fail this nation. Besides its economic resuscitation drive, one program the Babangida administration pursued with vigor was the transition to civil rule. It came and operated, and just when the Third Republic was to fully set in, it got derailed by the political quagmire of the presidential election of 1993, which eventually led to General Babangida stepping aside, ushering in the first and only interim government in Nigeria's political history. Chief Anis Shonekan thus assumed leadership of the country in August 1993. I feel most honored by this national call and it is with a deep sense of responsibility that once again I accept the challenge to serve as the head of the interim national government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Today's historic event testifies eloquently to our enduring capacity as a nation to fashion out our solutions to problems arising from our peculiar circumstances. Thus, that we are innovating with the interim government following closely on the heels of the Transitional Council should reassure us all of our ability to bounce back even when it appears we are moving dangerously close to the brink. That General Babangida has decided to quit the stage now bears testimony to his unrivaled sense of patriotism, courage, and selflessness in the service of the nation. The task, ladies and gentlemen, before the interim national government is enormous. Primarily, we must successfully complete the political transition program which has been in progress since the inception of the Babangida administration. Happily, much progress has been made at the local, state, and even at national levels. The remaining part of the program, as of now, is to conduct presidential elections and hand over to a democratically elected president at the end of the interim period. The Chief Shunukan interim government was short-lived as it was disrupted in its course of running the affairs of the country toward civil rule by the socio-political crisis following the aborted Third Republic. The circumstances that brought uh, Chief Shunukan to power was quite understood. Nigeria was in crisis, a crisis of, uh, of, of, uh, of confidence and a crisis of, uh, of even to continue as a nation. And uh, the best uh, Babangida, Agui Babangida regime did was to create a, 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 a saga. And uh, Shoneka came in handy. The circumstances that brought him should allow us to condemn him. General Sani Abacha took over the leadership of the country in November 1993, thus terminating the interim government. After about five years in office, the Abacha government came to an end with the demise of General Sani Abacha himself in June 1998. Then, there was another leader, General Abdus Salam Abu Bakar. Abdus Salam Abu Bakar, to solemnly swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and that I will preserve, protect, 
and defend the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So help me God. Certainly, this is a great challenge. And I call on all to put hands on deck to move this country forward. Fellow Nigerians, we remain fully committed to the socio-political transition program of General Sami Abacha's administration and will do everything to ensure its full and successful implementation. In this regard, I'm holding consultation with all relevant agencies at the highest level. We shall need the full cooperation of all Nigerians to succeed in this secured endeavor and wish to attend invitation to all those Nigerians in self-exile to return home to join the process of reconstruction, reconciliation, and conclusion of the transition program. From takeoff, General Abdul Salam Abubakar fashioned out a political transition program that was executed with dispatch, culminating into the return to democratic governance 11 months later when he handed over the mantle of leadership to Chief Olishu Basunjo on May 29, 1999. Hello, Nigeria. With gratitude to God, who has given me the unique honor and privilege to stand before you today, I welcome you all to this momentous occasion. I welcome you all with a deep sense of happiness, satisfaction, and joy. On behalf of the citizens of this nation, I welcome all our foreign friends. After 15 years of military rule, today is significantly a day of promise for our great future. This day, May 29, 1999, must run second only to 1st October 1960, the day of our national independence from Britain. Let me express my administration deep gratitude to all those who participated in our trans transition program to democracy. I congratulate both the winners and leaders among our politicians who contested for elective offices. I congratulate the winners for their victory and the losers who are accepting their loss gallantly. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me at this juncture congratulate our new president, General Matthew Aremu Okotuala of Asanjo. And that I will devote myself and that I will devote myself to the service, to the service and well being and well being of the people of Nigeria. Of the people of Nigeria. So help me God. So help me God. And then Chief Olushiguna Basunjo re emerged again as the leader of the Nigerian nation. After being at the top 20 years before, then as a military head of state. Hello, Nigerian. We give praise and honor to God Almighty for this day, specially appointed by God himself. Everything created by God has its destiny. And it is the destiny of all of us to see this day. I commend General Abdul Salami Abubakar and members of the Provisional Ruling Council, PRC, for the leadership they gave the country 
in the last 11 months and for keeping meticulously to their announced timetable of handing over to a democratically elected government today. As officers and gentlemen, they have kept their word. And so that has been the history of the Nigerian state from 1960 to date, with succession of its leaders, the traverse of the great country Nigeria under the leadership of our heroes, a story of successions of leadership from the country's assumption of sovereign status to date, the Nigerian state, its leaders, and the task of nation building during their individual stewardship. I don't think there is any single leader. You see, I've been privileged to work with many of them. And I pity anybody who saddles himself with the governance of Nigeria at the apex point. It is Wahala. They in the, you see, once they get there, they are so bad by the magnitude of the work to be done and the great potential that can be achieved. And while they're digging, they work very hard. They don't work long hours. They work very, very long hours in spite of the distractions. And they, be, they begin to think as if they are the only answer to Nigerian problem, because they know what they want and what they want to do. They each worked for the unity of this country. You see, my people in the North Central say they are marginalized. We are marginalized. We produce a Kubugawan. We produce a Babangida. We produce Absalam, not so. Who else? We, and there, there, there we are. The truth of the matter was that none of the head of states considered themselves as representing their zones or representing even their province. They had a Nigerian outlook. If it was a question of them going there and using all their powers to get the maximum for their homes and for their states or for their zones, of course, the North Central State would be completely transformed. But none of them went in there with the intention of maximizing the benefit for his state in this Nigerian enterprise. They believed in moving forward to build one nation. They all did. They all did. They all do. They may be misguided. You may not agree with them. But deep down in them, they all believe in the greatness of the awareness of this country. It is uh, very clear that Nigerians uh, are very impatient about their leaders. It is also very clear that uh, Nigerians are so easily uh, moved towards condemnation than appreciation. And uh, we have not been able to project our heroes. We have not been able to build on you know their successes in order to correct and, and learn from their failures. Uh, leadership is not a small matter. Uh, especially leadership of a country like Nigeria, over 120 million, with over 350, if you like, ethnic groups or ethnic nationalities, uh, 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 with a multi-religious uh, uh, environment. So it is not easy, you know, for a leader, you know, to, to, to get through, you know, in this kind of environment. Look at the beautiful and the and the, the the achievements of the leaders and build on it, and 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 excuse them, give them some excuse and some uh, benefit of doubt in areas that they have failed, because they are human, they are just human beings. Those are fallible human beings. In fact, they alone do not fail. If they fail you discover that the factors of failures are uh, uh, as a result of the non-contribution or misadvice or, or the recklessness of their lieutenants. And, and they didn't create this lieutenants so that you must be part. They're all human beings. So I think we should recognize that and, and begin to rebuild on the achievement of our past leaders and, and treat them with some respect and dignity. A nation that throws its leaders to the vultures at all time, uh, it's, not, it's not a nation on the path of development and honor. Nigerians 
have been very fortunate because God has given them uh, very good leaders. Let me take, for instance, the leaders we had in the First Republic. These are dedicated politicians and patriots, great patriots of this country. They fought for our independence. They, they virtually chased away the imperialists. And they did this without our shedding any blood. Unlike in other parts of the world, when they struggled for their independence, there were many lost, uh, loss of lives. But in our own case, no lives were lost. This was because of the wisdom of the people that championed our cause. These are, as you know as, uh, you know as well as I do, these are uh, Dr. the late Dr. Nanda Zikiwe, the Wola Furniture, uh, uh, Chief Awolo, and Alaji uh, uh, Bello, the South Down of Sokoto. These were the, the key uh, people who struggled for the independence of this country. And when we eventually got independence, and the government of this country, the free, the, uh, the free government of this country, country was placed in their own hands. They did the work well. The transition was a very difficult one, from the colonial era to a self-independent government. It was quite difficult, but they were able to, to organize the N N Nigerian people, to bring us over right across uh, 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 the problems we had during the colonial rule to all the expectations we had for the uh, uh, self-government that um, we just got from the British. We had quite a lot of expectations. We believed we were going to have very good health. We believed we were going to have education. We believed we were going to have uh, good roads. We believed we have quite a lot of things. And we really, they, were, they made a big start in this direction. We learned from the good work of our past leaders. We will learn from their mistakes, because they remember they made mistakes too. We will learn from uh, both their mistakes and from the good work they have done for us. And, um, uh, and based on this, we are going to improve Nigerian nation. We are going to improve the lives of our people. We are going to move this country forward. We are going to strengthen the bond of friendship that, are built, that the past leaders have built for all of us. And that is the only way we can then move this country forward. Mm -hmm. And they serve the atmosphere of the time. You see, forget, you know, uh, General Obasanjo is the president now. I'm sure he may not be see anything good in what happened before him. Maybe he is not even seeing much good in what he did before. But don't forget that somebody else will come later after him and will not see much good in what he's doing now. So that is an irony of life. And uh, you're not bothered. And that is good and healthy for a country. A country where a leader will come and say, what I am doing now is better than what was happening, what happened yesterday. I think is good for that country because it shows that that leader is yearning for development. Agui Renzi came, of course, just for six months. He, saw, he was just getting ready to take off and he was killed. So it's difficult to judge Agui Renzi. Then, of course, Gawain came. The one came and spent nine years plus. For that time, at that time, the one served the purpose. He did what he could with the resources available. And uh, at, at least Nigeria did not uh, rise up against that leadership.
And in any case, Garong was full of praises in his time. After Garong, Murtala came, who is difficult to judge Murtala because Murtala spent only six months. And so it's difficult to see actually specifically what he did, which you could judge. But then Obafanjo came, he spent four years or so, you could see specific things which he was able to do during his time, during his time. And it was, at that time, it, there were good things. The same thing after Obafanjo Shagari came, and Shagari did the best he could in his time. That's what I'm saying. You see, so we will continue. And the, the, what is good for a country is that every succeeding generation should think that what the previous generation has done is not good enough, and they want to better it. That is good for a nation. Why you have a nation where a leader comes and he says, sorry, I can't do better than what my, my predecessor has done. That nation is doomed. The world, it is said to be like a stage. Every man plays his role and takes his exit. To a nation, leaders are the protagonist characters in the interplay of life. Each one at a time, Man's the mantle of leadership and hands over to the other, thus expanding his part in the particular circumstance he serves. Nigeria is a land of many contrasts, a land of many bounties, and a land of many historical antecedents. All these perhaps determine the kind of role a leader plays and purpose. In all, no one thing will do full justice to the tremendous contributions of our heroes in the growth and development of independent Nigeria from 1960 to date in the country's peculiar setting. All that can be done is to appreciate their resilient stewardship with which they overcome those vagaries of life over the period which ensures the continued corporate existence of the great country Nigeria. That has been our heroes for this week. I will be with you again next week on the program. Thank you for watching. Good night.